It's no secret, America is in decline. From crumbling bridges to underfunded schools, the country is slowly falling apart. But on the world stage too, the US is losing its once invincible aura. From retreats in Afghanistan to embarrassing failures against Yemen, Washington does not seem to hold the same power it once did. And this past week's presidential debate was an embarrassment for the world's superpower. Yet even as it loses influence, it is attempting to crush the rise of China and stimmy Russia, risking nuclear war in the process. Now, Washington is also supporting a very unpopular war in Gaza by backing apartheid Israel in its genocide. I have here today someone who saw imperial U.S. foreign policy firsthand from the inside. Lawrence Wilkerson is a retired U.S. Army colonel who served as chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. In recent years, however, Wilkerson has become a strident critic of U.S. foreign policy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So let's start with a big question. Is the United States in decline on the world stage? And do you agree with my introduction? Actually, I agree with just about every word of it. <laughs> I think it's clear to at least half the world now, some 4 billion people, if not more, that the United States is not the power that it once was. Reputationally, because of things like state-sponsored torture and now state-sponsored genocide, um, our reputation is in tatters in the world. I had one legal scholar whom I worked with in Sicily many years ago on international criminal justice tell me, Larry, you no longer have a reputation. You are not the stalwart supporter of international criminal justice, international criminal law, international law, period. You are an agent for chaos in the world. Those were his words. Um, and when you talk about history and the history of empire in particular, I've just finished reading for a second time uh, Peter Farrakhan's uh, book, uh, the Silk Roads, which is a marvelous chronicling of all the empires or many of the empires throughout history, um, the Persian, the Eastern and Western Roman Empire and so forth. And uh, what you find in that history, of course, uh, are examples of precisely what's happening to us today. Um, the things that are occurring with us with modern accelerated rates, if you will, happened in the past to the Romans, to the Persians, to all manner of other people. Um, it's just the nature of empire that when you start declining, you reinforce failure again and again and again. It's a, it's a weakness of military operations in particular, but of diplomacy and foreign policy, security policy in general, that when you start losing, you reinforce the loss. Look at Ukraine we are reinforcing what is clearly a defeat for NATO and for Washington and for London, Washington's poodle in particular. Um, and yet we're reinforcing. We're sending billions of more dollars. We're trying to steal Russia's money to send it to the Ukrainians. Um, and look at Gaza. We reinforce there when we're losing there also. We reinforced in Afghanistan for 20 years. And in Iraq, we lost there. So one of the great signs of declining empire is consistent and constant reinforcement of strategic failure. And that's our major move in the world today, is reinforcing our failures. You run out of uh, means to do this too, as we're doing right now in the Red Sea. I just read an article about Eisenhower, the major US aircraft carrier in the Red Sea. The troops have been there so long. Uh, they've not been home. They've not seen their families. Uh, there's no sign of Eisenhower being relieved. Um, the deployment is excessive, to say the least. And every day they get to see the Houthis shooting deadly missiles and flying deadly drones over their aircraft carrier. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a great place to be. At the same time, you've been there way too long. Can you give us examples from within the military that indicates the U.S. is indeed in decline? Most dominant way right now that troubles me as a military officer, a military professional, is we cannot recruit people for our armed forces. The Army, the Air Force, the Navy have all for two years now been thousands short of their recruiting goals. 
the propensity to serve amongst American draft age people, 18 to 24, is down to 9 percent. So there's no relief in sight. The demographic behind that 18 to 24 demographic is 15% smaller than that demographic. So that means you're not going to have young people in the future to recruit to the numbers that you need. In the reserve components, which are the heart of the military ability to mobilize and to go to war, we're even shorter, 30 to 33% short on recruiting goals in the reserve components. So let's just put that in layman's terms. If the United States were to go to war with Russia or China today, we would lose badly. We would lose badly. We do not have the mobilization mobilization capability. We do not have the people. And we do not have the defense, defense industrial base, despite the protestations of Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan that we do. We don't. Uh, Russia has a much more robust industrial base now, and China has the best in the world. Um, so if we went to war with either one of those powers, both of them together being the likelihood, we'd lose. So what would we do? We'd turn to nuclear weapons. And that is our fallback position. We have about the same number of nuclear warheads as Russia. So when we go into a conventional struggle that we can't get out of and that we're losing, we will go to nuclear weapons. So we will, for the second time in the history of nuclear weapons, be the only power to first use nuclear weapons. You've spent a lot of time in the halls of power in Washington. It seems like U.S. policy to weaken Russia, China, and Iran all at the same time has brought these nations actually much closer together and caused them to form a union. Have U.S. attempts at destabilizing all three nations caused a geopolitical own goal for Washington? Yes, that's a good way to put it. I like the, so the soccer terminology, the football terminology. We have scored several own goals. And the biggest one right now is, as you indicated, forcing these countries, because I don't think it would have been it would not have come about as rapidly as it has. It might eventually come about um, that there would be an alliance, a formal alliance against us. Um, but it wouldn't have come about so rapidly if we hadn't made so many mistakes, particularly in Ukraine and now in Gaza, because we are building up a world of people who detest us because of our support of what the Israelis are doing in Gaza, the genocide in Gaza. Uh, Biden, for example, is probably losing 100,000 voters every week in this country and making his uh, possibility for being reelected slimmer and slimmer every day. And Gaza is the principal ingredient in that failure. Uh, but it's reputational all across the world now. We have some 2.6, 2.7 billion people under formal sanctions in the world. That's the other thing we do to people besides bombing them and killing them we sanction them. <laughs> and the sanctions in many instances have backfired. Not only do they not punish the people we want to punish, but punish the poor people in the country like Iran. But they also backfire by, as in Russia, making Russia go to other places for its economic needs. And now Russia's economy is banging on all eight cylinders and doing quite well. Thank you very much. Um, and what we did was, if you look at a graph, if you look at the trade 10 years ago between Russia and the United States, it's quite extensive. But if you look at the graph today, it's flipped over. The top of the graph has become the bottom of the graph. So the United States and Russia have almost no trade. And the two main partners for the United States today replacing them are Mexico and Canada. Russia has flipped it over for itself with China. So they replaced us very swiftly. And now they're looking to even replace the medium of exchange that they use within their system. In other words, drive the dollar out, use commodity-based trading, or use the yuan, the renminbi, or the Russian ruble. Um, and they've made plans to do this to trillions of US dollar equivalents across the Russia-China border. Um, this is this is a replacement of the Bretton Woods system that the United States spent so much time developing and exercising and using throughout the world post-World War 
too, the swift banking system and so forth. It's not going to be used anymore by at least half the world. That's a true blow. When that happens, that means U.S. debt, astronomical as it is, $35 trillion of aggregate debt, a trillion dollar interest payment every year on that debt starting this next fiscal year, that is going to go out of sight when we no longer can demarcate that debt in our deflated currency. That's going to be the end of empire, the end of empire. Well, let's talk about the genocide in Gaza. President Biden continues to draw red lines in the sand for Israel. And Netanyahu keeps violating every single one of them. Yet Biden continues to wholeheartedly back Israeli actions in Gaza. What do you make of this? And why is the U.S. so steadfastly supporting Israel? I asked myself that question many, many times in the last six, seven months. Um, I thought I knew the answer to it. I thought the answer was that there is so much money in the United States that belongs to Jewish billionaires who finance political campaigns. They finance APAC. They finance all the influence, which is exhaustive. It's in every state of the union that Israel has on the United States. I, I, I thought Mearsheimer and uh, Walt, Steve Walt and John Mearsheimer in their book, The Israel Lobby, were right in that that's the real reason that we are so stuck with Israel. But I've come to realize in the last six months that it's more than that. It's much. It's that, of course. It's huge, hugely important that, for example, there is a, a handler a constituent handler in every congressman's office, every congresswoman's office, senator, representative, there's a representative of APAC who tells them what to do on anything that influences Israel. So it, it is important. It's more, Israel's the greatest and most dangerous foreign agent operating on U.S. soil. No question about that. But it's more visceral than that, I've come to understand. Some of it has to do with heavy guilt felt for the Holocaust. Some of it has to do with uh, an enormous attraction to Israel. Um, and some of that is very, very religious. Um, the attraction is not one of affection. It's one of necessity. John Hagee's group, for example, Christians United for Israel, they think, they believe that Israel is necessary for the rapture to come, for Armageddon to come. And so they 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 send millions of dollars to West Bank settlers, for example, because they think that will bring about Armageddon faster. They think Israel is integral to Armageddon's coming about, and they think that if they help the West Bank settlers, then that'll bring it about even quicker. And they don't, you know, the Israelis just laugh at them because, you know, the prophecy is that when the rapture occurs, all the unbelievers will be killed. Well, the Israelis are unbelievers, so they'll be killed. But they laugh at that because they don't believe in the Christian uh, tradition. They don't believe in revelations and all that garbage. Um, and so it's it, it's a strange hookup, but you've got all these Americans who are attracted to Israel for different reason and reasons, and then you've got the billionaires who keep the Congress of the United States in the back pocket of Israel. Where else could you find a country and a country's leader so responsible for murder, genocide, invited to address the Congress of the United States? I mean, it's preposterous that that's the case, but it is the case. Well, Netanyahu is rumored to be coming to Washington, D.C. Um, at the end of July to address Congress. Um, he's a war criminal who's under investigation for war crimes and openly committing genocide in Gaza. Tell me what you've heard about opposition and support for his address in D.C. Well, your opening comments there were interesting because, as I understand it, the German leadership has said were Netanyahu to come to Germany, they'd turn him over to the ICC. <laughs> so, so that's an incredible <laughs> statement to make. The Germans have an even deeper and more passionate hangover from the Holocaust, as you might imagine, than we do. Um, but I think that should happen in this country, too. Um, I think he should be uh, apprehended and turned over to the ICC. What's going to happen, I hope, is 
as I heard in New York City this past weekend, people may get a movement together, sort of like Martin Luther King's March on Washington, if you will. That's the way they were talking and bring uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans to Washington and ring the Congress and refuse Netanyahu access to the Congress. Uh, now, they would be incapable of doing that if congressional leaders and congressional capital police were intent on getting him in there because they're underground passages and such where only they have access and only they can use. So they could bring him in. But that would be one hell of a statement to make. And it would make the press, of course, even the uh, poodle mainstream media, which usually sings Washington's tune all the time, New York Times, Washington Post, and all the cable television networks. Um, but it would be a statement that would resonate all across the country if millions of Americans said, BB, stay away from our Congress. Uh, I would support that. I would march on the Congress if they would invite me. There has been very strong worldwide condemnation of Israeli actions, but the U.S. keeps blocking any organized response to them and holding Israel accountable in bodies such as the United Nations, giving Israel the diplomatic cover it needs to continue this genocide. Is American support for Israel harming the U.S. internationally? And what are the consequences of such enthusiastic support for this genocide? Absolutely the case. Um... During my administration, we had a president who actually sanctioned at the top level, presidential permission, human torture. That lost us probably somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half people in the world in terms of uh, their views of our uh, support for international law, if you will, uh, our support for Geneva, the Geneva Conventions, our support for international humanitarian law, all things that we had worked since World War II to build up and to support. Now, this business with Gaza and our unqualified support for Israel, and that's really what it is, sending 2,000-pound bombs so they can bomb hospitals and kill doctors and kill children, kill patients and make their lives miserable, um, bomb food stations, bomb refugee tents, that's taken another billion from us, probably. So you see the movement towards the BRICS, for example, and you see India, probably the most important aspirant country in the world right now, not China, India, already outstripped China in population. India has India is the most populous country in the world now. But India has the capability, both technology-wise, entrepreneurship-wise, market economy-wise, to match China in the next 10 to 15 years. Were India to move out of its more or less neutral phase right now, and it's looking more and more every day like they might be thinking about this, and move more into the orbit of the BRICS in general, it'll always have a problem with China because they're still fighting on their border. And then were they to pull Turkey in too, and Erdogan is talking about this already, you would have taken the southern flank of NATO and eviscerated it overnight. Turkey's army is the most powerful land army in NATO. So you would take that away. You would see NATO beginning to collapse right away. Um, so you've got a, a movement in the world right now that's looking more and more solid, more and more adverse to the United States and its interests, and more and more interested in getting away from everything the United States has stood for since World War II. That's really not something the United States can stop. And we're doing everything to deepen it and to make it more serious every day of the week. Um, this is, as we said at the opening, this is the way empires in decline act. And we're, we're sort of following the script as if it were a Hollywood movie. I mean, like you've insinuated, Israel appears intent on expanding the attack on Gaza into a wider regional role, which it hopes that the U.S. and NATO will help with. What do you think the prospects are for this scenario? Netanyahu is in real trouble, politically and otherwise. Of course, he's been in political trouble for a long time. That's one reason he formed what he formed as a government and invited Smotrich and Ben Gavir and other uh, Nazis into his administration. 
Uh, but he's in trouble. He's in big trouble because he's he's hoist upon his own petard. It's burning. The fuse is burning, and he's got it in it. Got it in his hand, and it's composed of the war cabinet, which now he's disbanded. His government, which he's going to quickly have to disband, I think, the could. Um, and he's got this problem with his own uh, personal situation, whereby if this happens, he's going to jail probably. So you're right. He wants now, he's he's not defeated Hamas. If anything, Hamas has defeated him. He wants to elongate and widen the war so that it, as you intimated, will pull the United States in and get him off of this untenable position he's put himself in. And the most likely prospect is Hezbollah. Uh, Nasrallah, head of Hezbollah, does not follow Iran, Iran's orders to the, you know, to the letter. He's got his own strategy, his own disposition, his own desire to not cause Lebanon further destruction. So I don't think he wants Hezbollah to be in a war with Israel. They've exchanged a lot of fire, and now we've got 70,000 Israelis who've had to move off the border. And incidentally, many of them are now voting by leaving. Israel has lost a lot of people since this war started. Um, interestingly, many of them are going to Germany. Um, so he will he will keep prodding Hezbollah. He will keep attacking Hezbollah. He will keep bombing in Lebanon until he provokes a wider war. And his hope here, of course, is that not only does the United States help him with taking out Hezbollah, but ultimately going after Iran. That's his ardent dream is to get the United States to do Iran for him. Those, those, are the, those are his words in English. The U.S. will do Iran for me. He's wanted that for a decade plus, and now he thinks, I, I think, that he's probably closer than that to that than he's ever been. Not only that, the IAEA has released information. They still are looking fairly closely at Iran's nuclear program. And they've released information that indicates Iran has enough enriched uranium now for at least three bombs. They have not moved to make a bomb, at least as far as we know, but they have enough uranium to make three bombs. Now, Netanyahu is quoted previously as saying if he ever found out they had enough uranium for one single bomb, then he would attack. But he knows he can't win if he attacks. In fact, he would probably be defeated. So he wants us to do it for him. Um, I've got news for him. Were we to do it, we would probably be defeated too. I don't think, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I said it two years ago. I said it 18 months ago, one year ago. I don't think Israel will be a state in, in the next 20 years. I think Israel will disappear. And I want to talk about that famous prediction of yours. We've all heard you say it, that Israel will not exist as a state within the decade. What have you meant by that? And do you stand by that prediction? You will either have a state that becomes a true liberal democracy, has a capital in Jerusalem, and has inevitably, biology will not allow otherwise, and the right of return will not allow otherwise, a, a majority Arab population. That will not be Israel. That will not be a Jewish state. It will be a liberal democracy in the region of Palestine, and its capital will be Jerusalem. And it might go from 14 million to 25 million overnight as the right of return is exercised. Maybe more Jews will come too. I doubt it because they will not feel very secure initially, at least. If it's a successful liberal democracy, then you might build the Jewish population back up too. But it's what's its title going to be? Yeah, I don't know what its title is going to be. Palestine, Israel, I don't care what its title is, but it will be a true liberal democracy. All its citizens will be welcome. Um, that could happen. It's very unlikely, but it could happen. And the state would preserve itself, not as Israel, not as a Jewish state. We were going to put a billboard. We, the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, had spent $30,000. We were going to put a billboard up in Tel Aviv. We were scheduled to go put it up right before October the 7th. The billboard said, 
a Jewish state is not good for Jews. <laughs> it was true. It is not good. As many Israelis have said in the past from 1948 forward, if we are a Jewish state, we will be killing people over and over and over again. If you're a liberal democracy, you're not a Jewish state. It's impossible to be that. So that's one way it could disappear. The other way is through war. Uh, right now, the IDF would never admit this, but right now the IDF is losing. It's losing to a ragtag bunch of Hamas and other fighters scattered across the Levant, some in Yemen, some in Lebanon, some, of course, in Gaza. It's losing. It's losing. If you even look at the casualty rates that are being reported, and they're off by a, a large margin, both sides, they're off. But if you look at those rates, they're nothing like they were in the past. In the past, you would kill 40 Palestinians for every Israeli, or 400 Palestinians for every Israeli, or 4,000 Palestinians for every Israeli. That's not happening now. It's not one for one, but there are a lot of IDF soldiers dying and being wounded. Um, so you, you, know, you could be defeated militarily. Um, if you had Egypt pick up and suddenly find some courage, if you had Jordan pick up and suddenly find some courage, if you had other countries pick up and suddenly find some courage, even Bashar al-Assad in Syria, um, Israel could go fairly rapidly. If Erdogan decided he was going to march down the narrow strip of land from Syria to Lebanon to Israel and destroy the idea, if he could do it in probably six weeks. Um, Israel's future is very doubtful, extremely doubtful. And I say they won't be a state, not the state of Israel, not a Jewish state in 20 years, maybe less, maybe far less. You know, Israel has really exposed itself to be a paper tiger with all of its military defeats. And, you know, Israel has really shot itself in the foot by uniting Muslims across the world um, to support resistance in the Middle East against Israeli occupation and U.S. imperialism. What do you make of this? I think you've got one that uh, is pregnant, if I may use that term, for action at any moment. I think the theocracy in Tehran, for example, is working on borrowed time. The women put the lie to that theocracy's legitimacy in the last revolt that Iran had. Um, they are an illegitimate government now, held up only by the RGC and you know the people surrounding that. They're making tons of money off of the oil revenue and other things. Um, there was a report about uh, seven years ago. It look, took a look at one fiscal year in Iran, and it took a look at the trillions of dollars that they made off their oil and gas assets and how much the IRGC got of that. It was incredible. They got about a third of that money. So you got all these people who are ripping off the Iranian people, and the Iranian people know that. And this last women's movement almost, almost completely delegitimized the Ayatollah. And they're searching now, and one of the reasons they're doing what they're doing in Yemen and elsewhere is because that's the only way they can get any legitimacy, is by using the IRGC to do things around the region. Um, that's going to spread, I think. Uh, Sissy's position in Cairo is as dicey as Mubarak's was in the last year of his reign there. Um, it, it's a question of which way is the Egyptian military going to go. And I hate to say this because I like kind of like the king in Jordan, uh, like his wife even more, but they are tyrants in their own way too. And they're sitting on a powder keg of Palestinians also, and they know that. They outnumber um, the, as, as the old king used to say, they outnumber us. The, the elites in the uh, in the Arab uh, capital of Oman. So it's not looking, look at Assad in Syria. Why are U.S. forces in Syria right now? Do you have any idea why U.S. forces are in Syria? Illegitimately, there is no permission from anybody, let alone Bashar al-Assad, the legitimate recognized head of the government of, Israel, of Syria, 
He has not given us permission to be there. The reason we're there is because we're protecting oil that's being pumped to Israel. You heard me. Oil is being pumped out of Assad's country without his permission, protected by our soldiers to Israel at a discounted price. By the way, oil is also going much to Baghdad's ill will from Kurdistan, which is what they're calling it, the northern region of Iraq. Oil is going from their oil fields, mostly around Kirkuk, to Israel at discounted prices. That's why he can do this war. That's why he's got such a booming economy before the war, because he's getting all this oil from places he shouldn't be getting the oil for, from. He was getting it from Saddam Hussein's UN Oil for Food program through Mark Rich, who was a scandalous supporter of Israel and got put in jail for his black market activities. And then Bill Clinton, in an ignominious act, pardoned him in the last hours of his second administration. This is how Netanyahu built up his power in Israel. And it's how he got the Jews to be on his side in Israel because the economy was booming. It's still booming to a certain extent, given the war going on, but he's managing this war because he's getting oil from Syria and oil from Kurdistan. Um, nobody knows that in America. Nobody talks about that in America. It, I bet you half the Pentagon doesn't know that, but that's what's happening. Um, and when that goes away, Israel goes away, or its economy goes away, that's for sure. So give Bashar Assad back his country and give Baghdad back prerogatives over the northern portion of its country called Iraq, and that goes away. So it's a very ten tenuous situation for Netanyahu in particular, but for Israel in general right now. Well, you know, some people may disagree with your assessment of Iran's theocracy not having organic local support, especially considering many of the pro-woman protests you were just referencing to were hijacked, were infiltrated, and even organized by Washington paid actors. And the Western media here boosting the protests internationally in an exaggerated way based on our reporting here at McPress. They have a very powerful apparatus in the Pentagon that runs disinformation campaigns better than the NKVD or the GRU, better than it, better than the CIA in our own country. And those dis disinformation campaigns are used for just those sorts of things. It was very much to their uh, advantage, they thought, to have people think that the real reason there was turmoil in Iran was productive of our activities. Otherwise, they don't get billions of dollars from Congress to continue them. You've mentioned Yemen a few times, so let's 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 talk about Yemen. What is your assessment of Yemen's resistance? to U.S. and Israeli colonialism. I mean, this is the poorest country in the Middle East that has endured decades of war. And yet this country has united for Palestine and enforced a very successful Red Sea blockade. It's a strange juxtaposition that they find themselves in. Going back a few years, I was part of the effort in this country to use the War Powers Resolution in our Congress to get the United States out of Yemen, to stop our support for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and the others who were in the coalition in the beginning from pursuing their war because using our intelligence, using our fuel, using our bombs and such, um, they, were having, uh, they were having a field day killing innocent civilians. I remember vividly when they hit one school bus, I think it had 48 kids in it. And, the bomb that they hit it with was a Raytheon bomb made in the United States. And we got in both houses of our Congress, we got a bill passed. We got it passed and headed for the president, and he vetoed it. Donald Trump vetoed it. But since that moment of working with the coalition of forces in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia and in other places, as well as the United States, to get the U.S. out of that war. I had reinforced for myself what I found out when I was training Yemeni soldiers way back, um, 1978, 1979, when they were coming to the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was training some of them. 
And I remember vividly what they kept telling me over and over again, and that was the North and the South in Yemen were some of the meanest, meanest goat herders in the world, that they were tough, 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 and they didn't take, they didn't brook any opposition. You may recall when they had the civil, well, they had civil war going on almost the entire time, but the North fighting the South, the South fighting the North and different governments in different places. Um, so you let them loose with this war that was pursued ruthlessly against them by the Saudis and the Emirates. The Emirates, Emiratis got out of it after a while because they saw it was turning bad for them. Um, you let that happen for as long as it has, and you have built up a core of really tough, tough fighters. And all of a sudden, you give them Gaza, and they become the only other entity, really, other than Hamas, that's truly effectively fighting what they feel are the supporters of Israel and Gaza. Um, I love the way they <laughs> they differentiate the ships that they go after in the Red Sea because they don't want to go after someone who's not supporting that conflict. They're going after the ships or the people who are supporting that conflict. Sometimes it's hard to discriminate, but these are clever people. Um, and they are brave people, very brave people. I would not want to be on the other end of fighting the, uh, the people in Yemen. The Saudis have found that out, and the Emiratis found that out. The little Sparta, they call themselves in the UAE. Well, they're not Sparta anymore. Um, they got kind of handed their rear ends in Yemen. Um, so um, it's not surprising to me that they're recalcitrant and they're fighting back and that they are amongst the only ones who are. Tough people, in other words. Colonel Wilkerson, you were in the thick of the action during the Bush administration in the lead up to the U.S. invasion to Iraq. Talk to me about who the Bush era crazies were um, or the most dangerous people you encountered during your, time, during your time there. And are they still here today pushing for war? Absolutely. The neoconservatives are still with us. Before I go more into that, let me just something I forgot to say with regard to Yemen. Right now, Al-Qaeda in Yemen is the most vibrant terrorist organization, once again, on the planet, even more so than uh, ISIS-K. Although I saw today a report where ISIS-K is planning on attacking inside the United States. Reminded me of, you know, 2001 when George Tenet's hair was on fire and we were going to have an attack in the United States. But Al-Qaeda in Yemen has increased its recruits, increased its training, and is now looking out. So watch out, empire. Watch out, Europe. Watch out, United States. And these people are part of the reason this is happening, these neoconservatives. There are people like Victoria Nuland, like John Bolton. There's a host of them. Some of them are Jewish Americans. Many of them are Jewish Americans. Jewish Americans who had responsibility for the war with Iraq in 2003, like Doug Feith, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, they're still with us, and they're still pushing an agenda of America must kill everyone in the world who opposes it. That's their bottom line agenda. We must bomb or bayonet or rocket every little country, every big country, every medium country that opposes us in the world. Diplomacy won't work. We have to go after them with our military and our sanctions. That's their philosophy. That's the way they operate. And they're still with us. And they're still influencing Joe Biden's administration. You get rid of Vic Victoria Newland, and three more appear. Well, they say a tiger is most dangerous when it is wounded. Does U.S. imperial decline make it more dangerous to other states? Are they more likely to lash out or try some military Hail Mary to survive? Absolutely. And I'll quote to you the former leader of the National Assembly in Cuba, Ricardo Alarcón, who said to me one day, Larry, even a dying elephant can thrash a lot of grass. And he's right. We are a dying elephant. And as we die, we will thrash a lot of grass. I'm afraid, very much afraid, now that Putin has made overtures to Cuba, that 
it may be coming home to Cuba again, that we may wind up thrashing a lot of grass in Cuba. You may have heard the president of Cuba and the foreign minister of Cuba recently saying, Mr. Biden, do you want another Haiti? Do you want another Haiti? This was after our CIA helped stir up the mess in Santiago de Cuba, which was genuine protest, genuine protest over electricity, water, food, because Cuba is really a basket case now because of our blockade and because Venezuela had to stop sending heavy fuel oil and they they are really having problems and they had some genuine protests and what we did was stir them up so here's the president saying to biden do you want another haiti that's what you're going to get and now we have admiral gorshkov a frigate russian in port havana we have a russian nuclear submarine in port havana so a little bit of uh, if you can do it i can do it too putin to biden um yeah it's a uh, I'm, I worry about Cuba because they are having genuine problems and they're only 90 miles away. So a dying elephant, you know, presents a lot of problems for them. I mean, do you worry that the U.S. could seriously be contemplating a war with Russia and or China? It seems clear that the U.S.'s main goal right now is to slow down or stop the rise of or to stop the economic rise of China, at least, and a conflict sooner than later would be better for the U.S. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think the strategy that Jen Stoltenberg bought, the Secretary General of NATO, and that by that buy-in NATO bought, that Washington pushed on them was, look, guys and gals, we're going we're gonna to use Ukraine to bleed Russia. It'll take about six months to a year. We're going to bleed Russia down, and then we're all going to go after China. NATO and Washington, we're going to go after China. That was a strategy. I think that's been severely hampered now because they are not bleeding Russia. They keep saying they are, but they're not. Russia's economy is going bang, bang, bang. And this appointment of an economist to be the new defense minister for Russia was a, a very smart move because now what Putin is doing is he's using the industrial base that he's revived and made fairly powerful to go even further, maybe from 6% of GDP to 8 or 9% of GDP applied, so he can fight NATO. So their idea that they were going to weaken Russia and then go get China is totally, totally gone now. Uh, if it's not, they're stupider than I think. Um, so what are they going to do now? Uh, they're going to have to sort of slide off Ukraine after the elections and concentrate on China. What's keeping them from sliding off Ukraine right now and doing China is Gaza, which has weakened us in particular majorly because we've used so much of our armaments to rearm Israel each time it goes through a bunch of munitions. Um, so I don't know where the strategy is now. I know that uh, they're, they're staying with Ukraine so Joe can get reelected. And I suspect after the election, we'll see a different approach to Ukraine. But then the ultimate aim is to go after China. Um, and I don't know what that means uh, except loss. And that loss will present us with one choice. When China sinks three or four aircraft carriers, when China beats us in the South China Sea, when China takes Taiwan by force, I don't think they're going to do that. But if we force them to, they might. Then we'll go nuclear. And then the world loses. The world loses badly. Every former government official turned, you know, government critic uh, has been sounding the alarm about nuclear war, that we are closer to nuclear Armageddon than ever before. And it's really terrifying. Tell me more about this. Well, I, I still work with some people who are what I would call nuclear weapons experts and nuclear war experts from the old Cold War days. Um, they're in my age group now, but they think we're closer to an exchange than we've been since 1949 when the Soviets exploded their first bomb. They think wow. we're closer than we were in Berlin in that hot summer of 1961 when they built the wall and closer than we were in October 62 with Cuba and the Cuba Missile Crisis. 
Well, thank you so much, Colonel Wilkerson. We hope to have you on again soon. Thank you for having me.